so um welcome and it's brilliant to see you here and uh, i'm judy that's olaf and uh, we've been we're very excited to share clean language with you um there are so many things we could say to start with two things i would like to say say right up front one is um what we're not talking about this evening and one is what clean language is all about and i tend to start with uh, what clean language is all about or six ways you can use clean language because it's not so much what is it because uh, it's a it's a disruptive methodology that does all sorts of things but what it does is what matters so six of them that i've pulled out as being particularly valuable to a lot of people are number one it can help you harvest known information. So if you're ever requirements gathering or interviewing or scoping or any of those kind of things, it can help you find out the stuff that people know they know. Number two, it can help you explore the stuff that people don't know that they know, the unknown knowns. It can also help you shift emotional states, help cheer people up, or if that's something you want to do, help, um, depress people down a bit. So shifting emotional states can be a really important thing. Um, it can also motivate people to change. So if you're in any kind of change work, whether you're coaching, consulting, any of those kind of things, clean language can help you to motivate people to actually make a change. Number five, clean language can help you give and get really excellent feedback. And number six, while you're doing all of that, it will enhance the relationships between you and other people, which is quite a big deal. There are not many things, many approaches, many methodologies that can do all of that and more. And I should do a disambiguation piece. When we're talking about clean language on this call, we are not talking about, not swearing, we're not talking about speaking or writing more clearly, we're not talking about the programming language called clean. And we're not talking about um, this, the thing which is in NLP, neurolinguistic programming called clean language. That's similar, but not the same. And uh, let's, let's not go there. Um, so what is clean language? It's an inquiry methodology. It's a disruptive inquiry methodology that does all sorts of stuff. Now, Olaf, why don't you explain what, well, how you got into it, and uh, maybe that will start to make it a little bit uh, clearer. I, I give my summary. Um, when you think about listening as giving somebody space to think, then clean language is the tool that you want to explore next to help them explore their thoughts. So it's a method of being in service of another person, could be multiple persons, <clears throat> where they want to clarify their thoughts and you want to help them increase the clarity of their thinking. Uh, a byproduct is that you understand their thinking too, but that's not the main point. The main point is to be at service to the other brains doing the thinking. And that's what made the big impact on me, having this clarification. That's the, the sense in which clean language is clean, like clean feedback is clean, which is something that we will cover in our training. Um, or clean slate is clean, which is part of the Temenos method that I use. It helps you separate your own shit from somebody else's shit or their shit from your shit, depending on which perspective you start with. Um, and that's extremely helpful because it reduces conflict, it increases clarity, uh, it increases responsibility and accountability in, in, in certain areas. And it helps you become better at coaching because what I had heard when I started out as a coach is that there's this basic assumption that the client owns all the resources they need to understand their problem and to get to the solution and yada, yada, yada. And I uh, sort of believed that, but then my ego always got in the way because I was the agile expert. I was getting into places and I knew how to develop software and they obviously didn't because they called me in to help. <laughs> and, um, learning in conversations where I use clean language, that this assumption that the people actually have all these resources and they can actually solve their problem because clean language keeps you from interfering, keeps you from 
bringing your own thoughts, your own assumptions, your presuppositions, your own opinions into the conversation. It just separates that from uh, what the other person does and thinks. Um, and that totally changed how I show up as a coach. And it, it's definitely the tool out of many I've learned in the past five to 10 years. It's the one tool that changed my effectiveness the most, had the most impact on, on my effectiveness as a human being and as a coach. And history, um, I stumbled up on Judy, uh, I think early 2015, when you did this metaphor mastery course. Is that roughly correct? So it's two and a half years. We are doing clean language courses together. So what is it, Judy? Now, now, now let's, let's get going. Let's, <laughs> let's do something. Yeah, I think really you, people get to understand what clean language is once they experience it. That seems to be and the... What kind of experience is that experience, Judy? Well, they experience being asked clean language questions and being invited to do their best thinking and a space gets opened up for them to do their best thinking and they think, ooh, this is worth exploring. Particularly when they right. notice... Invited and mm. do their best thinking. Is there a connection between feeling invited and doing their best thinking? Um, I think, I'm sure there is a connection that, that people don't feel do, they're doing their best thinking when they feel under pressure, mm. um, when they feel that they're being pushed or pulled or manipulated. Um, there's an, an invitation helps people to feel comfortable, relaxed, um, excited, interested, and curious. Invitation, interest, and curious, and you're doing the best thinking. I guess you got a pattern of what I was doing. I was repeating things that Judy said and highlighting connections and asking questions about her words. That's, that's what you do when you, when you use clean language. And it's one important thing at the beginning, when we practice, we want to be clean because we're practicing this new way of inquiry, but it's not about being clean or not clean. It's not, there, there's no clean police. It's about building your awareness so that when you are in a conversation, you are conscious when you are bringing your own stuff into, in, into the conversation and when you want to keep it out of the conversation. So while you're staying in the clean space, you're separating your shit from their shit. But there are very, very good reasons in many conversations where you want to stop doing that and just tell somebody what to do, for instance, which is not a clean language thing to do. But there are situations where that's called for and where that's a good thing. So it's not about being clean or not clean. It's about having, having the awareness of when to do what and, and building this into your vocab vocabulary and stance, so to say. I think one of the very interesting things when people start to learn about clean language is the first thing they say is, oh, well, I do that already. I know which is my shit and I know which is somebody else's shit. You know, I know about asking questions so that I don't influence somebody. And then they discover what happens when they turn up the cleanness in their questioning. And, they, and what happens is they open up a larger space for the other person to do their thinking what they thought were, you know, not leading questions or questions that didn't have presuppositions turn out to be awash with presuppositions and prejudgments. Um, questions which force people down particular routes that, uh, you know, you never knew that you were doing that. So clean language can be very revealing particularly when you use the exact questions. Now, clean language was devised by a guy called David Grove, and he came up with this suite of, um, depends how you count them, but about a dozen clean language questions that he used all the time. And the idea was that he reduced the number of presuppositions and metaphors to as little as possible. He's not saying, I'm not influencing the other person because he is always influencing the other person when he asks a question, but he is saying, I'm going to attempt to minimize the amount of influence that I have on the other person in my, in my questions so that I know when I'm doing the other thing and it's nice and clear. So is everybody up for giving this a go? Would you be interested in having a play with it? that I would typically do with a group 
um, when they are work so a team that are working together and I want them to communicate more effectively with each other in their work but it's also a really nice icebreaker that you can do with a group and I typically if, if I'm in a room with people I get you know just get them jumping up and doing it in pairs and lots of rush, uh, blowing whistles and ringing bells and basically, basically making it all happen um, what it involves is a starter question and then two clean language questions. First, let me in invite you to all to consider the starter question. Here it is. When you are working at your best, you are like what? Now, it's one of those questions that's got no right or wrong answers. Whatever is your answer is your answer. Um, when you are working at your best, you are like what? Now, lots, lots of different uh, answers are possible to that. You could say when you're working at your best, you're efficient and organized. You might say when you're working at your best, you're like a, a Formula One racing driver. You're, it can be an answer that's metaphorical or an answer that's not metaphorical. But uh, when you are working at your best, you're like what is the starter question. And then once you have an answer to that, somebody might ask you one of these two clean language questions, which I've put in the, um, in the chat window. The two questions are, what kind of X? And is there anything else about X? Where X represents one or more of the other person's own words. Robin, can I invite you? Would you be willing to unmute yourself and, and share and do a little tiny demo? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, Robin, for you, when you are working at your best, you're like what? Mm. Energised. Energised. What kind of energised? Um, uh, oh god <laughs> I don't know um, just um, what kind of energised like a shooting star like a shooting star <laughs> blazing across the department <laughs> Like a shooting star blazing across the department. <laughs> and is there anything else about that shooting star when it's blazing across the department? Um, I, I probably uh, collect other people in my wake and drag them along with me. Mm -hmm. so you collect other people in your wake, drag them along with you. And what kind of shooting is the shooting of that shooting star? <laughs> what kind of shooting? Um, I don't know what what, what do shooting stars normally shoot. <laughs> uh, um, I, I I guess a uh, an enthusiastic, happy shooting. Enthusiastic, happy shooting. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that demonstration. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you for breaking the ice. <laughs> uh, and where, sh where should we go next? Um, Olaf, would you like to uh, pick on one of those people who are giggling? <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't see anybody giggling apart from Robin and I don't want to pick on her again. I picked up somebody I know. Mohinda, do you want to do, do you want to demonstrate with me? Okay. So Mohinda, me? yes, I hear you fine. So when you are working at your best, you are like what? I feel happy. Happy. Mm -hmm. And what kind of happy is that happy? Happy as if you are in a crowd of uh, people you like to work with. Mm -hmm. 
Happy as if you are with people you like to work with. Is there anything else about those people you like to work with? People who, who basically uh, don't interfere in the things you do or thinking you, whatever you're thinking about. People who don't interfere with whatever you do and whatever you're thinking about. Yeah. And when you need help, they come and help you. They come and help you when you need help. Is there anything else about those people when you are happy like that? Uh, they're friendly. They work together, communicate better. People are friendly, work together, communicate better. Mm. And is there anything else about you working at your best, happy like that? Because I feel that, you know, if, if I keep going, they wouldn't stop me from it. If you keep going, they wouldn't stop you from it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great demonstration. Does anybody else want to have a go? Yeah, I'll happily go. Will you ask the questions, Olaf, or should I? It's your turn. Okay. So, uh, what's your name, by the way? It says A. Harty on the phone. That on is the... Austin. Austin. Yes. Hi, Austin. So, Austin, when you are working at your best, you're like what? Uh, like a chef. Oh, what kind of chef? Um, one that cooks roast dinners. <laughs> roast dinners. Yeah. And is there anything else about that chef that cooks roast dinners? Um. Yeah. Well, he has to time everything quite well. Mm -hmm. Um. So he has to judge like when the vegetables are going to cook and when to put them in and like all the meat and the you know, when, when to cook that and has to do preparation before, um, you know, before uh, to make everything come together. And he has to time everything quite well. Yes. And he cooks roast dinners like that. Yeah. And is there anything else to... about that chef? Um, he's got some good knives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what else? Mm. Uh, he has a team around him. He can't mm. work without his team supporting him. Um, and he relies on the orders coming in. So he's got good knives and he's got a team around him and he relies on the orders coming in. Yeah. And then he times everything really well and then he cooks roast dinners. Gets on with the job. Yeah. Mm. Is there anything else about that chef? Um, he's got a pretty clean uniform. Well, <laughs> sorry. So a chef with a pretty clean uniform cooking roast dinners like that with sharp, good knives and a team around him. Yeah, I'd say so. Great. Thank you very much for that demonstration. Brilliant. <laughs> Who else would like a go? I'll go if you want. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. Olaf, would you like to take over? Yes, and maybe we find a second volunteer who wants to practice asking the questions. Is that Isha? Hi. I'm just scrolling up to the questions that you wrote so I know which ones to ask. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tim. Hi, Isha. Um, right, sorry, Bear with me. So when you are working at your best, who you are like what? Collaborative and focused. What kind of collaborative and focused? 
So facilitating others to to share their ideas um, and, uh, and and listen to each other to, to come up with with new and better ideas. And is there anything else about being collaborative and focus? Uh, the question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the the sometimes it's difficult to be focused, and um, I need. The help of others to to make sure that I stay focused as well as them. Okay. Um, is there anything else about um, being focused and having the help from others? Uh, no, I just think that it needs to be a, a shared thing. We all need to be in it together. Okay. Sorry, I don't know how to probe anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Thank, thank, you. thank you for volunteering first to, to do this. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if Tim could be persuaded to return the compliment. Uh, yeah, I can try. So, Isha? Hi. Uh, when, you are, when you are working at your best, you are like what? I am like an aeroplane. Like an aeroplane? Um, what kind of aeroplane? An aeroplane that is soaring through the skies, um, that feels quite liberated and, um, and, and yeah, quite liberated. Having well, uh, that's how I'm feeling my best. Yeah, uh, a soaring, liberated aeroplane. Yes. Uh, um, is there anything else about soaring and being liberated? The liberation help makes me feel like the the whole aeroplane is full of knowledge and and success because I'm I am working at my best so I feel like I'm carrying information and knowledge around with me. So as well as um, full of knowledge and success, is there anything else about that aeroplane? It's big. It's a big aeroplane, uh, and, and it feels. Um, yeah, it's just a big aeroplane with lots of information going through this. Brilliant. Yeah, now I'm stuck, so I, I can fill your pipe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Well done. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. So is anyone else itching to have a go in either role before we move on? When Isha is like an aeroplane and Tim is collaborative and focused and Austin is like a chef cooking roast dinners and Robin is like a shooting star and Mahinda is happy. Is there anything, anyone else who would like to have a go? Daniel. Daniel, which role would you like to have a go in? Um, uh, the question, if anyone's willing to question. You'd like to ask the questions? I'd like to answer the questions. <laughs> I'd like to answer the questions. Uh, Robin, would you like to ask? Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, Daniel. Hello, Robin. How are you doing? <laughs> Good, how are you? Not bad. So, when you're working at your best, you are like what? Um, a wild horse. A wild horse? Yeah, that sounds ruder than it would be. What kind of wild horse? Um, something running across in a herd um, across the savannah or something. Is there anything else about your wild horse running across the savannah in a herd? Um, they are all collectively working out where to go. Um, me and my fellow horses, and um, looking for the best opportunities to, I suppose, to feed. The best opportunities to? Feed. Um, is there anything else about them working collectively and looking for the best opportunities to feed? Yes, they look after each other, and um, uh, they are free and they can go wherever they like pretty much. 
is there anything else about them being free and going where they like? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where to go after that. <laughs> Is there That's great. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, well Dad. done. Nicely done. Well done. So when all of that and Wild Horse and uh, Aeroplane and Collaborative Focused and Happy and uh, Chef and Shooting Star and all of that, what difference does knowing all of that make? Now, when I'm working with a, a, a team, it makes a big difference because there's something in knowing how someone does their best work that enables you to help them to do that. Particularly when you get to the next levels of detail about this. So at the moment, we only know a very little bit about Daniel's wild horse, but we know that there's something about working collectively and um, Working, working together to, to find the best place to, to feed and so forth. Similarly, we know that Austin, it's important to have good knives and a team around him. So the metaphor is helping us to become clearer about exactly how we can help someone to do their best work. And they can talk more about what it is for them once you ask the questions. So Gina's uh, writing in, in the chat window, she's written it. Chat, win, chat window is wonderful in that you can write things private notes or you can write them to everybody. So Gina says it encourages communication. Absolutely it does. <laughs> um, it is one of those things that really gets people talking to each other about the stuff that actually matters inside them and around them. What's important to them about how they do their best work now, when I do this stuff with teams, you'll often get people, for example, um, who might have been clashing in, in their work. So people who really can't understand where the other one's coming from. And when you do this activity, you start to discover why. So you get somebody who said they were like um, an express train um, and somebody else who says they're like a butterfly and you start to realize why they're disagreeing about the procedures around the work. There's one person, it's all about getting it done as fast as possible and efficiently as possible. For the other, it's about visiting the flowers and noticing the smells and all that kind of thing. And, and you just learn a whole new layer of information about people. Now, a few people on the call have done that activity before, and I'm curious to know whether you learned anything new about yourself, either the first time you did it or the second time. What is it like when you answered the questions? What did you notice? I think you felt quite put on the spot. And, yeah. and it's, hard to, it's hard to think of an answer, really. Mm. I think it's a difficult question without sort of thinking about it beforehand and, and maybe sort of things don't just spring into your mind. Mm -hmm. So it can be a difficult question. You can feel put on the spot. That is definitely worth noticing, particularly on a big call like this, a lot of people about. Um, ordinarily, if I'm doing it with a team, I give them a little bit more time to think about it before I invite them to ask each other the questions. And then they're often asking the questions privately in twos before sharing with a bigger group, which again makes it easier for people to answer. Um, anyone else? What did anyone else notice when you were asked the questions? So I, I had to reflect on times when I'd actually had worked here at my best and think about what elements around, it, around me meant that I was able to work at my best. Mm -hmm. So you had to reflect. Yeah. What difference did that make? Um, it's a nice feeling to think back to, to times because when I've been working at my best, generally speaking, that coincides with being successful. So mm -hmm. actually it's, it's nice to think back to successful moments in life so that you can maybe apply them uh, and that learning uh, to, to future things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it feels good. It's nice to think back about those pleasant, pleasant past experiences. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really important point about what's happening when you're using clean language, because 
Well, what happens when you are asked a question? Well, pretty much whenever you're asked a question, you go inside and try and figure out what the answer is. Your attention goes towards the answer. It's almost impossible when you're asked a question not to think about the answer. So questions are constantly directing people's attention. And that's what happens with the clean language questions, just as any other questions. So I was saying earlier about how it changes people's emotional states. When you ask clean language about things that are pleasant, that people enjoy, it makes them happier. When you ask questions about things that people, are, that people experience as unpleasant and they didn't enjoy or they don't enjoy, then it will make them unhappier. So it will change people's emotional states. And there are ways that you can use the clean language questions to deepen emotional states of all kinds. There's, you know, it's more sophisticated ways of doing it, less sophisticated ways of doing it. But that's where that emotional state piece comes from. Is there anything else that anyone noticed when they were being asked the questions? You, um, you think about what you want to aspire to be like as well? Mm -hmm. yeah, so what you aspire to be like, so not necessarily what you, are, you were like this morning, but what you would like to be like. Again, it's that positive tone. Great, thank you. I noticed that um, the analogy came quite, or the metaphor came quite quickly, but the depth of what it was really like was a lot more thought. Mm -hmm. So that the initial analogy was quite, quite quick. Yeah, interesting. Um, for some people, it takes a while to think of an initial answer. For other people, it's when you ask another question that it takes more time. What I notice is that pretty much with everybody, there'll be a question or two that will make them think and a question or two they'll find really easy to answer. Um, and that's just the nature of people. But what it reminds me is just how few questions we ask in ordinary conversations that make people think. Questions that make people think are a rarity. And that's one of the things that's really unusual about clean language. So, Olaf, I think we should probably move the, move the frame along a little bit to, to talk about some of the ways that people use clean language. Would now be an appropriate time to do that? I would just like to highlight one thing that was just written uh, to the chat by Parag. Is that the mm -hmm. name or is that an abbreviation? That sometimes when we uh, give an answer to a question, especially in public like here, uh, we want to give a right answer and we have this fear of being judged potentially. Um, and this is something that always happens when, uh, yeah, when we're asked a question. This is like mm. a conditioning from school. You have to give the right answer. Otherwise you get a bad grade and things like that. So that, that's also something that this, this method of listening and inquiry can uncover and help you realize and then uh, move beyond it especially when you, when you establish this as a practice in a team, that you get to a level of trust where answers are not ridiculous anymore, but just interesting. And people develop the state of curiosity about each other's thinking. But just moving into the question, into the direction of the question that you just asked, how, how do you use this, right? So it's a trust building thing in teams. Mm -hmm. Not only um, is it helpful for a team to know how everybody is working at their best, how everybody is learning at their best, how everybody is doing whatever the team does at their best. It's helpful for people to get the time to think and it's helpful to establish this stance of curiosity about each other so that when something unexpected happens, we don't go to contempt, we go to, oh, interesting. So what's that like for you? What, what, what kind of whatever the other person is doing to get off my nerves <laughs> are you doing there? So you can, you can inquire with curiosity. And that culture can, can totally change how a team performs and communicates and works. 
Yes, there, there are actually so many different ways that people use clean language. It's always difficult to begin to think, well, what, what are people doing with it in the, in the agile world? Um, since we're in the Adventures with Agile um, call, we should probably focus on the agile world. Well, we are working with teams and you recently had this experience of talking to somebody who had a really extreme team situation that radically changed to the use of clean language. Yes, I did. Um, would people be interested in hearing a very short video um, about this particular character? He, I interviewed him, um, very short video interview on YouTube. And he's a guy who manages teams who work remotely in Antarctica. They're not software teams, but they are self-organizing teams. They have to be because um, basically you're stuck in Antarctica you, you, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a research station. And you can't be constantly referring to somebody back in Australia to tell you what to do. So um, if the, if the um, technology will play ball, I can just sh share a little bit of, of what he says about um, using clean language with his team, if it would be interested. Um, let's see if this will work. Um, I go like that and then press the play button. We would manage from a distance. So early on, we might uh, run a session and ask them for this season to be, for this field season to be just the way you would like. Uh, and you, for that, you will need to be, and the support you you will need is. Mm -hmm. uh, and more more recently, uh, the the team I guess has discovered that what it really needs to be uh, to work well and effectively is to be a little bit like the microbial communities that we promote in the in mm -hmm. the soil that we're cleaning up, um, where these communities can adjust, change, adapt according to the extreme conditions that they're exposed to. So that in itself has formed a bit of a metaphor. And what we now ask is um, for you to be uh, flexible, adaptable and resilient throughout the field season, you need to be like what and the support you need to be is what. Mm -hmm. And we've developed them to the point where they can ask each other these questions. And you, you see it, um, they might be working outside for long periods uh, and uh, for for Jack, whose metaphor is uh, he, he needs he's a young student and he's like a young orca that's always hungry for information. And people will call out to him and ask him, Jack, how's your orca today? And he'll be able to respond and, and self-check and self-calibrate uh, how he's doing and know whether or not he needs a different kind of support to maintain his resilience. So I, now, were you able to hear that? That's always the question. <laughs> yes. So people on this team get personal metaphors that they can check in with day to day uh, and see how your shooting star is doing, how your um, happy is doing, how the orca is doing. And then, and then people have those conversations. Is that, that how it worked? That is exactly how it worked. But basically, uh, you know, if uh, if he, if this young guy wasn't behaving like an orca, or like they they perceive an orca to behave, they'd start to to wonder, and they'd be able to ask him about uh, that situation and, and find out what he would like to have happen. What did he need to be to get himself back into a good state, um, and so on. So those metaphors became uh, almost like talismans to help people um, access their, their, their resilient and flexible states when things got tough and difficult, which inevitably they would if you're stuck on an Antarctic research station for months on a at a time. And the rest of that video, I'll share the link afterwards, but the rest of that video, um, will, he, he tells the story about how in, in the past, people used to um, come away from those field seasons saying, never again, I don't want ever to go back to Antarctica. Now they're queuing up to go back because they, they find working with their teams so much easier, comfortable, interesting, and so on. Wow, that's radical improvement. Tim is asking if it needs to be a metaphor. 
and I don't think it needs to be a metaphor, but a metaphor will be helpful because it has the sense of, um, it, it carries a lot more tacit meaning than if you just, uh, if you just ask uh, Jack, are you happy? Uh, if you ask Jack, how is your orca doing? Um, then for Jack and for you, having received multiple answers to this question over time, uh, there will be a richness of context uh, that comes with this orca uh, that will not um, go with um, a simpler word. And if you start out with happy, and you, if, you, if you ask, how, how is you happy today? Um, and if you would ask that for a week, and you ask more clean questions about it, there would probably be, as that's my experience, uh, a metaphor beneath uh, that, that, that would kind of evolve or emerge uh, over time as you're having these conversations. And another way of thinking about it is that all words are actually metaphorical. Um, there's no such thing as a non-metaphorical word. Um, because uh, a, meta so a metaphor, the simplest definition of a metaphor is one kind of thing standing in for another kind of thing. Comparing one kind of thing to another kind of thing. Now, any word stands in for the thing it means. So all words are metaphorical at that level. And all words compare one kind of thing to another kind of thing. So a word like happy is metaphorical, even if you don't think it is, even if you don't want it to be. Um, so, and, and a, a word can expand into a more metaphorical definition. So there's, a, there's an ad campaign in the UK at the moment, I've forgotten who advertises it, and whose slogan this is, but it's find your happy. And your happy is your unique happy. It will be different to somebody else's happy. So all its entailments and all its connections will be different to another person's. So to that extent, it is unique. And to that extent, it is metaphorical. Um, Andy is asking, does the size of the team make a difference? And the answer is yes, the size of the team does make a difference in that any team, a smaller team can build closer relationships than a bigger team. It's actually very different, difficult to remember um, the detail of 150 people's metaphors. It's relatively easy to remember the def definitions of uh, half a dozen people's uh, metaphors. So just as um, in any sort of team practice, there's an optimal size of somewhere between three and 20. I think that is probably true about doing work with metaphors as well, but you can scale it up by doing, by linking different teams and that kind of thing. Olaf, does that answer the question? But first we should ask Andy if it answers his yeah. question. Um, so he says yes. Um, I think, so, so my experience is that the, the process scales very well because it's extremely simple. And even if you have a bigger group of people where people have learned when they start working together to ask each other this question and to just check in that way, um, then it can be something that I can, I can learn in the morning with the five people I'm spending that day with. Uh, and it could be, could be a huge corporation uh, we're coming from. So I don't, uh, yes, the size of the team obviously makes lots of differences, but it doesn't mean that this practice can't work or that it doesn't have the same, same beneficial effect. Um, on the contrary, I think if you have a really large group of people and you establish a few practices like this where you just can say, okay, we are a thousand people, but every one of us is aware of how they're working at their best and can share it in a minute so that you can work with me so much better knowing um, how I am working at my best. Uh, that's a great thing to do in a large group of people and they could leverage that benefit um, a lot more than a smaller team maybe could. So. And last week, I, was it last week or the week before, I was in Prague for AIL conference and there were 230 people, 230 something people, I think, taking part in a similar activity to this. 
and uh, all at once, you know, in pairs, and it was all buzzing and exciting. And pretty much most people seemed to get a lot from it, and were talking about it for the following two days. So, uh, yeah, there was a lot going on when you even work, do the, do all this with it with a big team. Um, so we've talked about, um, we've done a working at your best activity. We've talked about some ways that clean language is being used with groups and teams. Um, the one other activity we're intending to do was a more straightforward coaching approach, which is based on clean language. Would that be of interest to people? So what I'd like to share is a really, really simple, um, coaching tool which was devised by a clean language enthusiast called uh, Marion Way. It was actually done for, for Weight Watchers where she used to work and um, in order for that to happen, for, for, for Weight Watchers to use it, it has to be very simple because they haven't got 20 minutes, they haven't got an hour with a person, they haven't got even 20 minutes with a person, they've got probably two or three minutes with each participant in a Weight Watchers class. So Marion came up with a lovely little way of uh, coaching using the clean language questions in two or three minutes. Is there somebody who'd be willing to volunteer to be a demonstration subject for this activity? You'd need to have something, oh, excellent Tim, you just need to have a topic to work with which is not too big, which you're willing to share a little bit about with the group is that okay uh yes yeah, fine i haven't actually got a topic off the top of my head so uh it's, uh, it's gonna be fun <laughs> so let's just think about a context how about tomorrow being the context so um your day tomorrow is our context so tim what would you like to have happen uh so Tomorrow is the end of sprint for a team that I'm supporting. I'd like it to be a successful day for them. Mm. So a successful day for your team that you're supporting. And what needs to happen for that to happen? The work that they're doing needs to be finished and demonstratable to, to stakeholders. Finished and demonstratable? Yeah. And what needs to happen for it to be finished and demonstratable? Uh, we need some support from, uh, from, from the DevOps team to produce an environment for them to be able to demonstrate against. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen for that environment, for that, the DevOps, dev, for the dev team to create the support environment? Uh, so I need to beg, borrow and steal some time to make that happen. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's about uh, trying to influence those guys to carve some time out of their day to support my team. And can that happen? I hope so. Um, I think it's a case of doing my best to, to make that happen. And is that an okay place to end this demonstration? Yeah, I think so. It certainly helped me solidify my day tomorrow anyway. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much indeed for that demonstration. Now, I'm really curious. Um, now that was obviously a very quick demonstration. I don't know how long that was, but probably about two minutes. What difference does it make? Uh, to me, uh, yeah, it, it definitely helped me to, to start to formulate a plan. Um, and, and I guess to actually see what uh, success might look like of, of that plan. So um, a combination of, of that, you know, solidifying the, the basic ideas into a, a set of actions that I can take. Um, and then, yeah, knowing that, what would happen if I do manage to get all those actions completed, what the world might look like. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed, because that seems to me to be quite a surprising result for a two minute coaching practice. Yes, I agree. <laughs> uh, Olaf, Ol you were saying something? Yeah, I, I was just saying yes, uh, I, I've seen it before and I'm still surprised, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's part of what makes clean language so exciting is that it is, it, you know, ostensibly it's, it's so simple. It's just a few questions. It's just about opening a space for somebody else to do their thinking. But the rarity of that 
makes it extraordinary. So while Olaf, what, what Olaf is saying is absolutely right, there's no clean police. And just getting people's hands on these questions and the ideas that underpin these questions can be really high value to people. It makes a difference. And I think that's, that's useful. So when all of that, and we've got about seven or eight minutes left of this call, um, what would anyone like to have happen in the last few minutes? There's time here for questions. Um, there's also an opportunity. I, I hope that you're curious about the two day training that Olaf and I are running in November for Adventures with Agile, um, which is clean language for agile practitioners. It's a course we've run a couple of times before and um, people have gone away really, really fired up and excited about using clean language with their teams. Um, so here's an opportunity for you to ask questions about clean language, about how you might use it, about how you might learn it and anything else you'd like to know. So, um, Sorry, Judy. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if you could do me a favour and you can explain to me what happened when you did the, uh, the, the, the couple of minutes talking to me because it was very, uh, for maybe for others who were observing, it was very, very clear. But uh, to my mind, I was focused on answering your questions without considering what your questions actually were. Reasonable question. So they're actually in the chat window, but there are three questions. What would you like to have happen? What needs to happen for that to happen? And can that happen? And you can just ask the three questions and it's high value with just three questions. But what I did was ask the middle question three times. Um, the reason I chose to ask the middle question three times was I had a feeling that if I asked, and can that happen? You might say, uh, not really. So I kept on asking what needs to happen until I thought, oh, I think he'll probably say yes when I ask what, what can that happen? <laughs> Interesting. Because yeah. we're helping you to figure out what are the steps that need to happen. And even if you did say, oh, well, and can, so if I'd asked, um, and can your team um, successfully present, I've forgotten the exact wording, you might have said, uh, no, because we haven't got a dev environment, or we haven't got a demonstration environment, I've forgotten again the exact words. Um, you can go back and say what needs to happen for a demonstration environment. So you yeah, can just see iterate it around, yeah. which Thank is rather you. nice. So there could be a loop around the last two questions and around the middle question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could go back to number one as well. So if, if, if you actually get stuck in the conversation, that's, a, that's another clean trick. You can use this what would you like to have happen question as a switch. So if somebody is, is, has gone down and is stuck somewhere, you can say, oh, when you're stuck um, and explain whatever they've said about being stuck. What would you like to have happen? So it's a question that reminds them of their choices, of their responsibility for the situation of whatever, whatever it is they can do uh, to, to get help. Or so, so these questions are powerful to, to direct people's attention to their options. Mm -hmm. So we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Kai has asked a question in the chat, but I think they've dropped off the call. Um, so their question is, so clean language is basically about how to use open questions in a positive way. Um, yes, yes up and, to a point, and <laughs> all the rest of it's hugely different to that. Um, so it's more, it's, it's more than powerful. They are, specific, they, they are very specific in the way they are phrased and the way they are used. Uh, so it's more than just powerful questions. It's not about being positive at all. It's about being non, uh, non uh, interfering with your own assumptions. You can ask powerful questions in a very interfering way. Um, so there's yeah. a, a difference to this whole body of knowledge around powerful questions and the body of knowledge around clean uh, it looks the same from the from, from from a distance but it's it's very different once you start using it 
I think another big difference is the way that clean language works with metaphor. So the clean language questions were originally devised to explore the metaphors that underpin people's thinking and that drive their behavior. And it's when you hook together clean language with metaphor that the magic really starts, starts to happen. So Andy has asked, can you ask those questions to a team, the, the one minute motivation questions? And I believe, um, yes, you can. Um, what can be really even more effective is to get them in pairs, asking those one minute motivation questions to each other, because that enables you to have the individual experience of thinking it through and then maybe share the answers with everybody. Um, Kavita is asking, when you use clean language, should you first explain to the person team about clean language and then practice, or can you just use it? How do you practice? Olaf, that, dep you dep that depends on your confidence and fluency. Um, and and of, on the context, obviously. So uh, some situations, people might find it weird if you go into coaching stance where you ask questions like that then you definitely should ask, can, you, can I coach you or can I use a coaching practice? If you are still practicing, definitely say, I'm practicing something, this will be weird. Uh, it will be because it's weird to you. Uh, my experience is as soon as it stops being feeling weird to yourself, it stops feeling weird to the other. Um, if it's just something you do, uh, if it's natural to you, people will just go along and, and answer the questions. And even if you just ask, may I ask a question about that before you ask mm -hmm. your first question, it can just make everything a bit more inviting rather than pouncing on. <laughs> um, and you can practice in all kinds of ways. I, when I'm teaching people from scratch about clean language, I often get them to ask those two questions that we talked about earlier. What kind of X and is there anything else about X? I say, use those in your everyday life. Use them in the shops. What kind of bread is that bread? Then they're tripping off your tongue so that when you use them in a more exciting environment, um, they're less uh, difficult. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Jay is asking, how is this different to using context-free questions? Is that a thing, context-free questions? It's not a thing that I've come across before. So Jay, I need a little bit more, bit more, ex, ex, more explanation to be able to answer the question. Um, Austin is saying, ultimately, this is clean space language, keeping your questions open without your own bias to allow the other person to fill that space with their answers without being as influenced by you. Absolutely, yes. I agree, Austin. It's also yeah. clean space language in another way, which is that works with your space a psychological geography, your, your psychogeography. People keep their thoughts somewhere. So everybody who answered the questions earlier about when they were working at their best, they are like what? Let me ask you, think of your answer. Whereabouts is your answer? It will be somewhere. For some people, it will be inside their heads. For some people, inside their bodies. For some people, in and around their bodies. For some people, a long way away. But it will typically be somewhere. And this feature of thought, as far as people can tell, is something that David, that David Grove um, was one of the first people to really get their hands around this idea that thoughts exist in space. And so the clean language questions work really well with that spatial idea, which is probably way beyond what we should be talking about on this call. So um, Jay is saying that um, context-free questions about not including your own biases in your inquiry, usually used for requirements engineering. So yes, this would be an advancement and development of that idea of context-free questions so, mm -hmm. uh, on, so most research, academic research um, interviews would claim to be um, unbiased, would intend to not influence the responses. But James Lawley, who's quite well up in, in the world of clean language, is one of the people who've devised a way of measuring 
how clean those questionnaires actually are. And you can submit your um, academic questionnaire to be assessed. And he's found that obviously um, these questionnaires are very much on a continuum. Some have actually got hugely biased questions in them that people don't realize are biased. Loads of presuppositions that people just didn't spot. Um, whereas the clean questions are as unbiased and non-judgmental as pretty much it's possible to be. But it's impossible not to, to bias the impact of any survey, any investigation, because we are, we're human beings, we react with our environment, we interact with other human beings, we interact with other objects. So if you're handed a heavy questionnaire with a questionnaire on it, you know, heavy clipboard, you will think that the survey is more important than if you're handed a flimsy piece of paper with no backing. We can't not influence by all these different um, means. Um, Mahinda has a question, do you ask open-ended questions? Um, some of the clean language questions are formally open questions, and to some extent they are the most open questions you can ask. But are they open-ended? It depends on the way you are thinking about open-ended. What kind of open-ended is your open-ended? Um, so open-ended questions would be something like, is there anything else about all of that? That's a yes or no question. In the way I would talk to, taught to ask or not ask questions as a coach, uh, that's the non-open-ended closed question that I'm not supposed to use. That's um, a closed question. It puzzled, puzzled, pu puzzled me at the beginning, but people don't care. People will tell you if there's anything else, they will tell you. And if you get a geek, they would say yes. And then uh, you ask, and what kind of yes is that yes? <laughs> and then you're back in the game. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So we've... We're, and we're and now, we are five minutes over time. We're five minutes over time. People are having to go and get their tea. So let's say thanks everybody for being here. It's been absolutely brilliant to, to share all this stuff with you. It's been, thank you everyone who volunteered to, to, to step up and be part of the demonstrations and the activities. Um, I do hope we can see you again in November for Adventures with Agile's two-day course with myself and Olaf. Um, if you'd like to know more about clean language in general, um, do go to my website, judyreese.co.uk. There's a free ebook you can download from there, which is called Your Clean Language Questions Answered, which will hopefully answer any of the questions that you didn't get to ask or didn't get answered today. And if you have anything else that you would like to ask me or Olaf, we're very easy to find. Drop us an email or a text or um, a, a direct message on Twitter and we'll do our best. Is there yeah, anything I'll ask something in the, in the meetup group. You can also ask questions. We could answer there. So we can, we can definitely keep the conversation going. Indeed. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to Thank Charlie you. and to Adventures with Agile for setting this up. It's been great. Yeah. Cheers, then. Good night. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.